you and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Pat Mitchell, and it's my privilege to be co-hosting this event today with the Women's Learning Partnership and its founder, Manaz Akami. Welcome, thank you, Manaz, for this opportunity to be with you uh, to feature this film and the conversation that will follow with some extraordinary women leaders. Manaz, as probably most of you know, uh, is the founder of the Women's Learning Partnership, a partnership that serves 20 autonomous women's rights organizations around the world, reaching 60 countries, working in 30 languages, and we're going to hear a lot more about WLP and its work. But Manaz is also, importantly, the former Minister for Women's Affairs in Iran. She's been a leading advocate of women's rights for more than four decades. She's the author of several books, including a forthcoming memoir, The Other Side of Silence, how the global women's movement found its vision and its voice. That book will be released in the spring of 2021. And today we get to share with all of you the release of a very important film, It's Up to Us, which Manaz created with a community of women who are partnering in this effort for women's equality everywhere. Manaz, it is such a privilege to be with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pat, for uh, supporting this and moderating this event and also for connecting us to the Connected Women, which is such a, an important initiative at this very moment, so timely. And uh, the film uh, today is uh, basically uh, an exercise uh, in uh, the community of partners who work with us, reviewing what the state of the world is. And to be able for this anniversary, 25th anniversary of Beijing, which is right this year, and 20th century of the WLP partnership, to present that overview of where we are and also presenting the points of view of uh, some leading activists from across the world on the various issues which we are facing at this moment and possible ways of uh, alleviating some of the problems and rebuilding the kind of societies that we wish to have. And we know in order to do that, Manaz, as you have modeled throughout your decades of work on women's equality, we know that to achieve that more just and equitable world, we have to work together. And that is part of the partnership that uh, Rhonda Carnegie and I have initiated with the Rockefeller Foundation called the Connected Women Leaders. And many of them are with us today and they represent a community of compassionate, leaders who are in fact leading us toward that world. And it is that kind of partnership that we need now, as you said so brilliantly, Manaz, and that the film calls on us to activate. So let us begin our time together today with this opportunity to see for the first time uh, an extraordinary film. It's up to us. And we're going to share the screen now to share the screening. Democracy is in peril in every region of the world. 
Desperation in the tens of thousands. Global health emergency. Death toll keeps climbing. We don't have what we need. Australia is on fire. We think we'll become extinct. Irreversible. Shouting and chaos. Crushed through the identity gain nationality to pass on citizenship. It's time for the world. The human cost of this world. To wake up. This is real. In our power. Sea levels already all with extinction. Fake news. Stop this crisis. During the 20th century, more than 100 million people died in wars. In World War I, 90% of the casualties were military personnel. But since the end of World War II, 90% of those killed in conflicts have been civilians. Many of them, women and children. In Syria alone, more than 500,000 people have died so far. And millions more have been displaced. Uh, Recent decades have given rise to ethnic, sectarian, and religious conflicts that have resulted in senseless killings worldwide. From ethnic cleansing in Myanmar to the Saudi-led proxy war in Yemen. In Yemen right now, you see pictures of children with just skin and bone dying in their mother's laps for nothing, a war that has no justification, that nobody wants, and for what reason? And nobody's trying to stop it. In Central America, where gangs run rampant, gender-based violence is used as a means of intimidation and coercion. El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala report some of the highest rates of female homicide in the world. Across the global south, rebel and terrorist groups have killed hundreds of thousands and forced millions from their homes. Rare footage of the group Boko Haram in northeast Nigeria. Most of these Boko Haram conflicts target homes, where most times men walk outside the homes and women are there to uh, fend off the uh, attacks, protect the children. One woman was fleeing from uh, gunshots. And she finally got to an IDP camp and realized that the, the child Ahaba had caught a bullet and died. She has not spoken since then. Rape as a weapon of war. Chemical attacks on civilians. The ever-present possibility of a nuclear attack. These are the realities of our world today. Women have had no role in planning or implementing these atrocities. The people who are making decisions are the men. So now is the time that we just have to say stop. These are our children, these are our family, these are our brothers, our husbands, our daughters. There are better ways. And we are the ones who need to step up and bring about change because the world we see is unsustainable on many fronts. We're losing the Arctic as we know it because of climate change. 
This is a forewarning of all the hardship and problems that will spread around the planet. Decades of fossil fuel use, greenhouse gas emissions, and aggressive deforestation are causing the temperature of the Earth to rise at an accelerated rate. And that is setting off a dire chain reaction across our entire ecosystem. Everywhere I went in Africa, I kept hearing things are so much worse now. And it was the impacts, and it was an eye-opener for me because I saw how severe it was in undermining food security. The burden on women to put food on the table. If the drought is very severe, they have to go further for the firewood, further for the water. So my understanding of climate began with a human rights lens and a gender lens, and then I read up on the science, and I said, oh my God, this is serious. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which includes scientists and experts from 195 countries, has presented data that shows that the average temperature of the Earth has risen 1.1 degrees Celsius since the 1950s. That might not seem like much, but consider this. Before the 20th century, it took more than 11,000 years for the Earth's average temperature to increase between 5 and 10 degrees. In just 70 years, the Earth's temperature has already increased 1.1 degrees. And that upward trend is predicted to continue. The IPCC is warning that we must work to limit that increase to 1.5 degrees to avoid catastrophic consequences. The scientists said you have to reduce by 45% global carbon emissions by 2030. And this is doable if you have the political will and you have 12 years. Now we're in year 11. One of the most visible consequences of global warming is the fury of extreme weather across the planet. More violent storms causing massive destruction. Devastating floods wiping out crops and livestock. Severe droughts yielding fewer crops. Out of control wildfires destroying homes and wildlife. And rising sea levels threatening coasts on every continent. The Middle East is going to be highly affected by climate change. Lebanon, for example, used to be one of the richest countries in water. And now, with low precipitation, we actually suffer from water scarcity. And adding to this is the sea salt water intrusion. People now dig wells so that they can get water their crops. And by doing so, you see sea salt coming from the sea, replacing the excavation and the exploitation of these aquifers. As these impacts intensify, scientists predict more people will face food insecurity. Availability of clean water will decrease. Severe flooding will encourage mosquito-borne diseases that will thrive and spread. And thousands of species will become extinct because of radical changes in their natural habitats. We are destroying the systems that sustain us. We're crazy. We have to change. And for those who rely on the land and natural resources for their livelihood, their very survival is at stake. Climate justice is really the understanding that those that have contributed the most to the climate crisis that we're in right now are not going to be the most severely impacted. Those who have contributed the least, who are living fundamentally lifestyles of low consumption, of low emissions, are facing the brunt of climate impacts not tomorrow or in a few years, but they're facing them today. Because our ocean is getting warmer, it affects the coral and where our fish live, which affects the livelihoods of our people that have to live off the ocean. You can clearly see over the past years, the fish stock declining. 
the World Bank estimates that the impacts of climate change in the global south could result in the migration of 140 million people before 2050, creating an even greater refugee crisis than we already have. For many, migration is a matter of life or death, and their options are becoming fewer and fewer. De no moverse es más que nada enfocarse a la familia. In the United States, we went from allowing about 100,000 refugees in 2016 to now capping the number at about 18,000 or so. This is a significant reduction, especially when you consider that the United States has a population of over 300 million. And what we really need is the global solution because it really is a global problem. The top five contributors to greenhouse gas emissions include China, the United States, India, Russia, and Japan. The Paris Agreement making history at the UN, China, and the United States. In 2015, 195 countries came together, including China and the US, and adopted the Paris Agreement. It was an encouraging start to a global effort until the political winds changed. The Trump administration is about to roll back policies on the environment. After his election in 2016, President Donald Trump announced that the U.S. would pull out of the Paris Agreement. Since then, his administration has overturned or weakened more than 80 environmental regulations put in place to mitigate climate change. President Xi of China recently announced plans to build more than 300 coal plants across Asia and the Middle East. And under Brazil's far-right president, Jair Bolsonaro, there has been an 80% increase in deforestation of the Amazon rainforest. Bolsonaro was backed by a powerful agricultural lobby that has been pushing for more development in the forest, completely disregarding indigenous people who have been caretakers of the forest for hundreds of years. These are people who have learned to be good stewards of that environment without a total environmental collapse. The problem is that in the business world and governments as well, a short-term gain is more important than a long-term gain. Um, and that's a very dangerous concept. The climate crisis is a feedback of the current injustice and inequality that exists in our world. It's the clarion call of the earth saying, this is what happens when you have a system that's based on extracting resources from one community to the other, um, when it comes to prioritizing profit over people. It's the same forces that oppress people based on race, based on class, based on gender, that also wield this control over nature that has a disrespect for how it impacts us globally. Every family in this world is now connected one to the other in the same ecology. We actually rely on other human beings to help us with our ecology. So what they're doing in the Brazilian forest is impacting everyone, is impacting me, and how climate change is going to affect me and my security. There's no such thing as personal security, divorced from or different from global security. That is the reality of our security now. I remember once meeting a woman on a train. She was telling this very sad and painful story about an uncle she adored who admired her. He was working on a family tree and she waited and waited and waited for her copy, didn't get one, was talking to her brother and said, oh, I got it ages ago. And she insisted on seeing it. And that's when she realized that her beloved uncle's concept of family was only the men. None of the women were there. So what do you do with that? She did not know how profoundly she was a family until she saw that family tree. Throughout history, women have been subjugated in a system, in a structure of relationships that begins in the family and goes all the way to community, to the political system, to culture, to religion. 
to the economy. Everything supports the patriarchal system globally. And it's not easy to change. Dans notre religion, Rija le chaou mouna ala nisa. La femme, elle respecte les paroles de son mari. C'est son mari qui est son chef. C'est lui qui dit fait et évite. Because we are dealing with people who are socialized to think like that, we see this tradition being carried forward by men especially, but even women who have been socialized to believe that they are less than men. All religions have played a role in defining the subordinate status of women in society. Whether it's trying to control women's bodies or denying them their autonomy. In many countries, religious-based family laws determine many aspects of women's lives, including rights to marriage, divorce, child custody, inheritance, and education, and the ability to own land, among others. And in 25 countries, women don't even have the right to pass on their own nationality to their children or foreign spouse. Without citizenship, children have obstacles with accessing education, health care, formal employment, um, even inheriting the, the family home or owning property in the country of their birth simply because the nationality law of that country does not treat their mother as an equal citizen. They can't access even a cell phone in some instances. When you think of all of the things that require an identity card in this day of age, imagine trying to go through life without that. With the current rise of autocratic leaders worldwide, many of them are aligning themselves with far-right conservative forces. For the leaders, it bolsters their power. For conservatives, it gives them a way forward to turn back the clock and reverse the gains women have achieved. Despite the fact that we are a secular country, what we see more and more, it's uh, fundamentalist religious uh, groups occupying formal political spaces. And this is something that's very dangerous and it has a direct impact uh, in women's human rights and reproductive rights. Gender equality is not only important because it is a human rights for women and for everybody, but it is also essential when it comes to building peace and protecting human security for themselves and for their children. The one thing that is present everywhere in our world is gender-based violence, and it comes in many different forms. It comes on the attack of women's bodies. It comes in diminishing women's abilities so that women do not feel that they can contribute to the well-being of society. But women worldwide are speaking out and fighting back. Women have united to claim that time is up. Today, gender-based violence against women is discussed in Parliament, in the United Nations, in uh, businesses, and it is discussed in religious institutions. So it is now a common knowledge that violence against women does not happen to just women who are underprivileged, but even women who are privileged. It's not enough to tell the story. What must follow is how we are able to use this knowledge to really bring change for women and not to go backwards again. Income inequality has become one of the biggest threats to the global economy and a flashpoint for growing insecurity and unrest. In India, 10% of the population owns 73% of the wealth. In the Middle East, 10% of the population control about 65% of the wealth, while 60% of the population is classified as poor or vulnerable. In the U.S., 
the top 10% controls 70% of the wealth. Over the last 40 years, the average CEO in the United States saw a pay increase of 940%. The average worker received an increase of 12% over the same 40-year period. We're seeing what is, in fact, a global phenomenon. And it, and it is the rise of what I call Wild West capitalism. It is a determined effort by capitalists to ensure that the state serves the profit-making agenda of corporations as they make more and more money and share less of it with workers. Each year, the World Economic Forum measures the relative gaps between women and men on health, education, economic participation, and political participation in 153 countries. The countries with the closest parity include Iceland, Norway, Sweden, and Finland. The worst? Yemen, Pakistan, Iraq, and Syria. The United States ranked 53. The largest gaps continue to be in economic and political participation. Everywhere, women earn less than their male counterparts, have less chance of advancing to more senior roles, particularly women of color. And they do the majority of unpaid care work. In political participation, women only hold between 20 and 30 percent of parliamentary and ministerial positions. In Sweden, social protection systems enacted decades ago include parental leave, affordable childcare, and a more equitable tax policy for married couples. And this has had a significant impact. Women entering our labor force have helped our economy. Uh, Sweden has, and, and in comparison to other countries, a very strong economy. So even if the reforms cost money, we also get people out into the labor force and with the possibility of both having a career and a family. Our nativity rates are higher than in many other countries, and the percentage of women participating in the labor force also is higher. So if you look at the numbers and at our economy, it's a win-win-win. I declare the NGO Forum on Women, Beijing, 1995, open! In 1995, when the Beijing conference took place, if you looked at technology, at that point, and you look at technology today, and you see the enormous change in the landscape that has taken place. There was no long slog for technology. It was a giant leap. Why is it such a long slog for equality, for gender equality? That's the question to ask, and that's the point for this moment in time. As women, we have organized, we have mobilized, we have brought consciousness, but none of our goals, none of our aspirations are fully capable of being implemented unless we can change the system. We know that the patriarchal structures are not working. The way that leadership has been exercised, that power is only reached by being taken away from others. Power that we want as women is power to work with. Power that comes from community, from dialogue, from sharing. We need to educate each and every woman to make them aware about their power as voters and as activists. And we have to present a different model of politics, which is more ethical and more committed to the real needs of the majority of the population, especially women and children. To create holistic change, we also have to work together. So even if we're all working on issues separately, we need to come to a common understanding of the bigger picture. We have to work with men with progressive groups, and we have to reach a unified collective vision that we can also implement at every setting in the way that is suitable for them. You see the difficulties women face, and there's a commonality in that suffering, and there's a commonality 
in the challenges and we can choose to stay silent or we can choose to do something about it because if we don't who will we have to start with each of us each individual has to begin to rethink the world we seek and how are we going to get to it we have to start talking with young people at younger and younger ages in civics classes and in the home, in churches and community organizations about what is in the public interest, what is in the public good. That can be very helpful in the campaigning. The value of intergenerational communication is we can learn from what previous generations did, that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can adapt techniques and bring to it the new technologies that we have at our fingertips. We deserve a safe future. Get angry with those with more responsibility that aren't doing enough. And that's governments across the board, fossil fuel industry, agribusiness. They all should be doing much more. The story of change begins at the grassroots level because that's where the things happen. Any powerless people, once they understand what it could be for them to get their freedom, they don't go back. I think we need to understand that this moment we are living in is kind of the last gasp of patriarchy and racism. As difficult as it is to think that we are winning at this moment, um, I think we are. There is nothing that we can't do as women if we mobilize together and use the power of our numbers. The feminist movement is the longest, broadest movement for equality and justice that the world has ever seen. And it's the feminist movement that will lead us there. Manaz, I am so filled with gratitude. I think you can do this <laughs> as a response, and I am seeing them all over, um, all from the community of women leaders who have joined us, who join me now in saying how, what a gift this film is. It is a gift to women's rights movements, social justice movements everywhere. And I want to recognize that we've been joined on the screen now by one of the great leaders of social justice movements, Mary Robinson. Welcome, Mary. It was Mary who first brought this film to my attention and there's so many things I'm grateful to Mary for and I'm sure I share the community's gratitude for her work um, as the first president of Ireland and the groundbreaking legislation she led for women's rights, for the UN climate envoy work for her work now as chair of the elders and uh, the author of a book on climate justice, Mary has pointed us um, to the strategies of intersectionality. And before coming to you, Mary, I want to just go back to Manaz for a moment and say, for me, this is the message that this film creates and presents to us in an absolutely compelling way the intersectionality of all of the threats to equality and a more just and equitable world. 
So again, with gratitude for that, and with the um, acceptance that you have made it incredibly clear, we are the ones that the world has been waiting for to change the world. So how do we do it, Manaz? How do we use this film? <laughs> uh, it's always easy, easier to, to point out the issue, the problems than to point out the solutions. However, we are lucky to have had a group of people working uh, across the world for 20 years, since the beginning of the 21st century, to focus on just what we need to do. Uh, when we began, we had most of the same problems uh, in January uh, 2000, uh, but uh, we, it's gotten worse and worse, as we have seen. We've had wars that have not ended, poverty that uh, could have been uh, alleviated or made easier, it hasn't been done. We had a whole beginning at the United Nations and with other leaders to think about human security and not just military security. And that has suddenly almost stopped as a conversation. We have built enemies that are more imaginary than real. And uh, we have just spent so much uh, in, in uh, military equipment in, in all of these uh, unnecessary expenditures. Uh, so we have, as women have, as was said in the film, had very little to do with the decisions that have brought about this kind of work. But at the same time, we have been involved and we have done our best to bring awareness to the fact that 50% of the population are not presented. And this 50% contains all of the other minorities. It contains indigenous, uh, various races, ethnic minorities, uh, all the, the, the refugees, the disabled. So we do contain all of those. And we have worked as hard as we could, but we just haven't had a voice. And, and as was mentioned in the film, and you mentioned, Pat, uh, the, the countries that are doing a lot better all around, uh, all across these issues are the ones that are being led by women. So what we would like to bring attention to is that dire as the situation is, and people will be talking about it, our, our participants today, the situation is by no means hopeless. As a matter of fact, we see that the, um, the uh, terrible uh, pandemic and also the savage murders that have brought attention to the race situation in America have all shown us the positive things that we have at our disposal, including the connections that bring us here. It was a little bit, I'm sure, I'm afraid, uh, uh, faulty, but, but it still brought us together to work together. So the connections that we have has made, have made such a difference. We have seen, for one thing, the global nature of all of our issues from health to environment to poverty. But we've also seen how we can organize. The Black Lives Matter, for instance, in a period of two, three weeks, has become a global movement. And it has brought something really important. And that is that working in smaller pieces is very necessary and important. But in order to make substantial change, it has to be infrastructural and it has to be applicable in some ways globally. And so this shows us that we have vehicles at our disposal that we can use for the holistic change that we need to bring about. For instance, in the Black Lives Matter, uh, it's so important not simply to show our anger and our fear and our horror but to think structurally that is a, a necessary change has to be in the systems of protection, supposedly, and support for the population, the policing. So that is a very important change that this, this last uh, two or three, four weeks has brought about. Yeah. So uh, now we, we hope the conversation uh, will, uh, beginning with Mary, hope, uh, help us to think through the ways of, of, of change, uh, the ways of, of organizing for movement building for change. 
And that will be the nature of our conversation here today. And Mary, it is so appropriate that it begins with you because you have been at the forefront of so many of the, these movements. And we have an often not optimized the intersectionality of all that we are fighting for and fighting for together. And in the film, you say something that I think about when I think about you and your leadership. You, you said, we have to get angry. And you described yourself as an angry granny uh, before, and I've joined you in that. We get angry. We have new tools like this film, Mary. How do we use the anger and the tools and everything we know as women to use our power to move forward? Well, first of all, I think it's a very brilliant and very timely film because, as you were saying, Pat, it does bring out the intersectionality of poverty, inequality, race, gender, being a migrant or refugee, being somebody who is indigenous, uh, being somebody with disabilities, being on the margins. And then it brings out the intersectionality of the causes as well, which often aren't brought out together, but the filming is very powerful, powerful forces, forces that are putting profit before people, and I think that's why it's such an exciting film at this particular time. And I'm conscious as an elder that I want to bring out the voices of the young. Um, the elders at the moment have brought out on our website, theelders.org, voices of young activists. And uh, one of them, the, the most recent one, um, Jamie Mar Magdalene from Colombia, she's an 18 year old one. She has a lovely message for climate activists. She says, mm -hmm. Dear fellow climate activists, the fight for climate justice and the fight for social justice are inseparable. There is no such thing as a single issue activist. Sure, you can have an issue that you predominantly focus on, but all issues are interconnected, especially when it comes to the issues of the climate crisis and race. And those in the climate movement need to be in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement. At this point, there should be no talking of staying in our lane or only taking about, or talking about climate change because the fight against climate change and the fight against systemic racism are inseparable. And I would just add, and the fight for equality and the fight for you know, all of the things. But it's wonderful to hear a young voice say, get out of your silo. And why I say that is, this is the moment. Because you know, as I watched the film, I watched it several times, I watched it this morning, and I thought to myself, people might think it's all very well but this is a bit weak. It's saying, you know, it's up to us, but you know, we're not very powerful, but actually think about what COVID has taught us, COVID-19. It has taught us about the collective power of people. There is nothing else protecting us from this virus all over the world, except complying with the lockdown, the social distancing, the washing hands, etc., and having in mind those who need to be protected, the more vulnerable, like, like all of us, the three of us, in fact, um, the health workers, the care workers, the essential workers, many of whom are women, of course. So the collective power. We didn't realize until COVID-19 that actually it's a very powerful power. And that is something that we need to remember because this year is the 75th anniversary of the Charter of the United Nations. And when I served... Um, as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, I remember over and over again saying, I don't serve these member states. I serve the first three words of the Charter of the United Nations, we the peoples. And that's what I always felt, we the peoples. And we the peoples now have to know our power and have to assert our power on behalf of humanity. And I think of that collective power of women coming forth, as Manaz already referenced, in a way we have seldom seen in, in such an irrefutable way too, that women's leadership has uh, made such a difference in the countries and in the organizations that are being led by women because we have this opportunity now to change not only the nature of power by the way we use it and share it, but the nature of what we can do together. And that's the, the call for, of this film, Manaz. It is up to us. And the good news is we're ready. For, we're and, and prepared. Passion, it's, we, it's, interesting, 
it's interesting, Pat, that women are leading well out of COVID. Um, yeah. people are, um, that you know, Angela Merkel in Germany, the prime ministers of Norway, Finland, Denmark, Iceland, Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand, the president of Taiwan, they've taken tough decisions and they've taken their people with them to, to take the measures and they care and they show an ability to lead in this way. And it's very remarkable. And so I think it's shifting a sense of how women have the capacity to lead and should be leading far more. And we should have more balanced, um, you know, 50% of cabinets should be women, 50% of boards in private companies, 50% of everything. And we should have gender balance, gender parity, and gender voices, women's voices. And COVID-19 has also shown us our fragility and our connectedness to each other, as well as the Black Lives Matter movement, which you also referenced, Manaz. We bring all of that into this conversation about what we can do as a global community of women leaders together. So I'd like to add some additional uh, global women leaders to join us now. Uh, w welcome to Hafset Aviola. She's the president of Women in Africa Initiative, and this is a platform that is organizing the continent's leading women for sustainable change and development. Uh, Hafset is a, an economist. Uh, she's a pro-democracy activist. She lost both her parents, actually, to her country's democracy struggle which is being celebrated on this day. So it is a very special day that Hafsat joins us. Hafsat, you must be feeling many emotions today. The celebration of your mother and father's contribution to democracy in Nigeria, the importance of the women's leadership we're seeing all over the world, the difference it's making in a time of crisis. What does this film say to you and the placement of your work, um, all the intersectionalities we have discussed? You know, as I watch the film, and because of today's um, anniversary, I'm reminded also about the role that women played in my country. The women market women, the women the markets of Nigeria. They shut down markets for months, jail, because of the articles they were writing. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Pat? Yes, we're having a bit of an audio uh, lead, and so some of us are yes. going on mute, including myself while you're speaking, because I don't want to lose a word, but we are all here with you listening. Thank you. So, you know, we we went through such a struggle. My mom was gone down on the streets of my country because my father had been put in jail for winning the election and the soldiers didn't want a democratic system. So they put him in, ambushed their car and gone her down. But the Nigerian women stood. Then when we got a democratic government in 1999, if you looked at the democratic government, you would see hardly a woman's face. Women were nowhere. And it was a shock. Today in Nigeria, at the, in the Senate, we have about 7% women. In the House of Reps, the lower house, we have about 3% of the members of the House of Reps be women. We don't have any governors that are women in any of the 36 states. The, the marginalization of women is real. And it has taken an impact on the country because when we look at 21 years after that struggle and after the return of democratic rule, you don't see the gains. Economically, we're, we're poorer. In terms of health, in terms of education, we're weaker. Our people have less investment in health and education um, compared to even the time when we first started the struggle. So when I look at um, the film and it says it's up to us, I really, it resonates very deeply with me because I know that women would not allow the increasing poverty. Women would not allow such vulnerability. They wouldn't allow a situation where doctors and nurses are providing care and they don't even have the basic protection. We wouldn't allow a world like that. And the world we're coming into now because of COVID-19 is a world that needs women desperately. We're looking at a world where we're expecting about 100 million young people not to have work. Not only do we, will they not have work, they're also described as 
no skills for employment. We're looking at such marginalization globally. Somebody needs to speak. Women have always been powerful about speaking truth to power. This is the time not only to speak truth to power, but to be in powerful positions and to do what Mary Robinson did. Her role was to be serving the people. Many times other people go into office and they're worrying about their position and the next position and how to position themselves. And they forget the raison d'etre, why they are there. Women often do not forget. It's not that women are perfect. And I want to speak also about the issue that I found very powerful in the film, the inter intergenerational dialogue. When I first met my manners, it was within the year that my mother had been killed. I met her in San Francisco at a global conference. The manners asked me to join the Board of Women's Learning Partnership. For her, she wanted somebody to represent an African perspective. For me, it was learning ground to see what we could do to build women, how we could organize women, how we could organize differently from the way the prevailing, prevailing norms of our society. I was there understudying manners, understudying the work of Women's Learning Partnership for years. Now, as president of women's, um, Women in Africa, we have 8,000 entrepreneurs in 54 countries of Africa. We have 800 partner organizations. We have, I don't even know, 100,000 followers. The way I exercise the power of our organization, I learned at the feet of a great woman. And, and I want to say, you know, the young people have so much power. And in Africa, we say that um, if you stand on the shoulders of giants, you can see farther. We also say what the elder sees sitting down, the child cannot see even standing up. I really would like us to come together like this. The elders and the young people as a force as a force, there's a, an awakening in the world, as Manas pointed out, there's this awakening all over the planet because of um, the COVID-19 and also because of the Black Lives Matter movement. But Manas should also have reminded everyone about the Arab Spring. Everybody was so optimistic during the Arab Spring and we woke up and discovered that actually what we have now is a winter. We never, somehow we missed summer. And that's the possibility now for organized to fill the vacuum, to enter into the void. We will lose the opportunity. So if we come together and be united, really there's nothing that can stop us. Pat, you have to turn on your mic. Thank you so much for that reminder. I did that to share bandwidth so we could hear every precious word you had to say. And you reminded me of another African proverb that seems so appropriate for our conversation. If you want to go fast, walk alone. If you want to go far, walk together. Our next guest who joins us for this conversation has been walking together with women uh, for so many years. She has spent an entire career fighting for women's rights and gender equality, and established a women's health program at the Ministry of Health in Brazil. And more than 25 years has been working there for equality, advocating for women. Since 1910, she's been the executive director of the Women's Refugee Commission, which is a New York-based non-governmental organization working to promote gender equality and resilience for displaced women, children, and youth. Please join me in welcoming Sarah Costa. Sarah, there are so many issues that you are dealing with on a daily basis that are in the film in the most compelling and powerful ways, showing the intersectionality again. Um, how do you see this film in the context of your work advancing us to walk together far? Well, thank you, Pat. Um, I, I mean, just going to the film, a strong and inclusive women's movement, I don't think has ever been more important than now. And we must ensure that the voices of refugee and displaced women in general are part of the conversation. Um, the, 
the film to highlights the the number of people that are being forced um, from their homes um, by conflict and crisis and increasingly climate change the numbers are staggering um, and we know that it's women and girls as others have said who are hit the hardest by displacement and they experience as we've also seen in the film higher rates of sexual and gender-based violence, child marriage rates often shoot up, and every day more than 500 women and girls in emergency settings die during pregnancy and childbirth. And a recent study shows that not a single country is on track to achieve the sustainable development goal of gender equality in 2030. That's astounding. Fragile and conflict as affected states are furthest behind. Countries like Yemen, Syria, South Sudan, and women and girls in those countries are falling the furthest behind on all SDG indicators. And they are suffering the double disadvantage of where they live and because of their gender. And quite honestly, at times, working in the humanitarian field, trying to protect the rights of refugee women and girls, it appears that the world is looking the other way. Governments are failing to come up with long-term political solutions to the displacement crisis. They are failing to uphold the rights and protections agreed under human rights and international law. They're failing to adequately fund humanitarian response programs that address the really difficult concerns and issues that people are facing. They're failing basically to even address the millions who are stuck at borders, warehoused in camps, and waiting in these dire conditions to um, a file for asylum. So undoubtedly, I think funding is urgent and vital. I would argue that there's also a pressing need to really rethink how humanitarian aid is delivered. We have to do better. And fundamentally, the humanitarian sector hasn't moved far, far enough or even fast enough to push forward a gender equality agenda. We need to change our approach and change the way we think about the drivers of injustice and inequality for displaced women and girls. And we need to reconsider how we in the humanitarian community can play our part in tackling those injustices and inequalities. And I'll end by saying that if we don't explicitly address the multiple and intersectional inequalities that shape the experience of and response to humanitarian crisis, we run the risk of inadvertently reinforcing those inequalities in the work we do. And moreover, and I, you know, very importantly, we run the risk of squandering the enormous potential that displaced women and girls can bring to achieving solutions including peace building, climate justice, and ending gender-based violence and gender discriminatory laws. I'll end there. Thank you, Anne. As a, I, I hope there will be time, Sarah, to come back to hear exactly how this film also can advance this important work that mm -hmm. you're doing and harness the power of that community that you reference. I'd like to welcome now Hassam Karam, welcome, Hassa. She is the Secretary General of Religions for Peace. It's the world's oldest global multi-religious leadership platform with 90 affiliated national inter-religious councils, six regional ones, all operating with a unique interfaith global network of women and youth. Aza, it's so great to have you here. She's a professor of religion and development in Amsterdam and served two decades for the United Nations and has been on the front lines of all the work that we saw in the film. And I'm thinking in particular the context of this film and, and how you see it advancing the work within the faith communities all over the world. Um, 
First of all, I just want to pay special tribute and congratulations to Mahnaz, uh, yourself, and the team at Women's Learning Partnership that, that put together this amazing film that has covered the spectrum of challenges and opportunities that we have and, and has effectively is effectively a call to action uh, in the most powerful way possible. So I just want to pay special tribute and uh, hats off to, uh, to the entire idea and the execution of this. I am particularly, I've been, I want to adhere and to absolutely affirm everything that all the other speakers have said, including the, 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 the speakers on the, on the chat who have made some very excellent points. In Religions for Peace, since I was able to have the privilege of serving in March, I took over formally in March, I think the, the, the general gist of the message is we work with all the religious leaders of the world, religious institutions of the world. And the general gist that I'm trying to push for, for us to be more sensitive to is the need for radical inclusivity in our work. So it's, it's, it's wonderful that the religious institution per se is serving and is one of the oldest social service providers known to humankind, by the way, long before we had governments and ministries and, and international organizations. The religious institutions are the oldest social service infrastructure. They're the oldest development actors, the oldest humanitarian actors. They're the ones who have been serving communities, health, nutrition, education, sanitation, you name it, for centuries, actually. So this is fantastic. This is wonderful. Um, it's absolutely amazing when they can come together and work together on common uh, human challenges. Even more amazing when they can come together and work together across the religious and the regional differences on common planetary challenges. It was very well portrayed by previous speakers and in the, and in the film. But what we're missing right now and what, what COVID has shown us is that we tend to retreat into our spaces of comfort, our zones of comfort. Even as social service providers, we want to look after our own. We are very, very worried, naturally, after our own. Um, and I think here's where we're all challenged at this moment in time because of COVID, because of the base of discrimination that comes with being human beings. We tend to discriminate one against one another as human beings. It's a very primitive thing, but we all tend to have that. It's part of who we are. The crises tend to make us exacerbate those, those distinctions, those discriminate, discriminatory attitudes, because we're so focused on once our, our own community, our own family, our own, etc. We see this happening as well. So the call for radical inclusion is even more pertinent today than it was just before this whole COVID outbreak. It is even more pertinent today as we talk about Black Lives Matter. And some of us fear that Black Lives Matter may be at the exclusion of other things, but in fact, Black Lives Matter means every human being's life matters, deeply, powerfully so. And therefore to emphasize the specificity of a Black life is not to exclude the others, but it is to show that radical inclusivity requires us to know that if one of us is to survive, everybody is to survive. If one of us is to thrive, the rest have to, th to thrive too. And they are, that interdependence is the feature of radical inclusivity. And I think we have to be deliberate about that as, as a women's, women's oriented movement, because I want us to see that women of faith, that women who see that their religion is not only their primary identity, but is what motivates them for it. In 2012, the Pew Research Center came up with a study that showed us that 80% of the world's population claims an affiliation to a particular religion. How dare we think that that is something that we can just include in one of our many identities? It matters to a lot of men and women who we are as people of faith. What our faith tells us is integrally important to us. For some of us, it's integrally important because we want to fight the structures of patriarchy and oppression we see and we experience and we know resides in religious institutions. And for some of us, it's important because it's precisely the callings of or the wording of the holy books that we have that motivates us and moves us to be the radical inclusive activists that we are, to fight for our own rights as women. Many of us wish to do so, indeed are very deliberate about doing so, fighting for our own rights as women because our religion motivates us to do so. How, how can we possibly include these voices in this broad movement, so that instead of focusing only on the dangers of religious fundamentalism, which are pretty pervasive and pretty awful, universally so, we can also showcase and highlight and celebrate the work that women of faith, that religious women 
including many within their own religious institutions, are able to break the, the patriarchal holds, are able to celebrate their womanhood and their humanity as they serve their communities and as they uphold their religious identity. I think we're still, we're still not, fun, not really that focused on that community of religious women or women of faith who work with us shoulder to shoulder, but we tend to see, we don't tend to see them as much. And one of my jobs is to say, and to make the plea to such uh, an August community, where are our women of faith? Can we be more deliberate about including them, raising their voices alongside the more secular voices? Because those in refugee and migrant camps, those who are most subordinated by a range of different factors, including racism and marginalization, are also people who go to their faith. So for us to assume that this is just a normal part or it's an incidental or it's a personal thing is actually for us to silence the voices of those who are active in the most amazing capacity. So how do we bring together our women's movement to be as a human rights movement that also includes the voices, the experiences, the narratives of women of faith or religious women in their spaces. Many of us are anyway occupying this space. I am a Muslim woman. I work in, in secular spaces and I have worked, done so for most of my life as a woman's rights activist. I consider my faith to be integral, but I never talk about it or emphasize it. Why not? If it is about being radically inclusive, it is also about accepting that this part of my identity doesn't undermine my legitimacy, should not be silenced as the rest of me, but is, but is in fact a very defining part of who I am and what I do. And there are millions like me. I think the day that we can look at the ghost within our secular women's activism, the ghost within that we tend to either not acknowledge or subsume, and we try to raise the voices of those who, amongst us who are religious, who are very convinced of their religious work, who see that the convictions that we share that are religious in nature are also very much what inform our activism. The day we can celebrate that together and be radically inclusive in that way is the day we will see that those divisions that we often create, especially in times of crisis, are this very same divisions we must combat in order to come onto the other side to then challenge the rest of the other um, uh, discriminatory uh, practices that we have. But we must look within and see who are we missing in our own uh, movements, in our own conviction? Who are we perhaps unintentionally silencing because we only want to see the religious fundamentalism, but we don't want to see the empowerment that also comes within those spaces. Thank you. Oh, has has such a powerful call for the radical inclusiveness that we know we have to we have to enact we have to bring together this collective power of every woman's voice and, and our allies and i must say i embrace that description of the ghost in the women's feminist global feminist movement because while we are the longest most sustained a movement for equality and it should be radically inclusive and must be radically inclusive. Um, that has been our challenge that has held us back. And Mary, I want to bring you back in because one of the issues that now we are hearing everywhere is, you know, how are we properly supportive of each of these emergencies, each of these threats from climate to human rights, to racism, sexism, the, all of the social justice movements, which we know are intersected, but how do we bring forth action and collective uh, in, in the radical inclusiveness that Aza so brilliantly called for? To, bring, to make the real changes now. Well, I like the radical inclusiveness. It's a lovely term. And, you know, what I'm really aware of is we're in a moment where we've been locked in our homes, many of us, not equally. In fact, COVID-19 exacerbates the inequalities and the, uh, the kind of uh, way in which we've talked about the intersection between those inequalities. But it also gives us space to think, to think about what it is to be human, how fragile we are. We're not living in alliance with the ecosystems that sustain us, with Mother Nature. I learned a little bit later than I learned how climate was affecting human beings, that actually we also need to link to the nature-based solutions 
to the fact that uh, we need um, an approach that really understands the utter connection that we have. Indigenous peoples understand this. And um, I love the fact that um, this film is saying it's up to us. We have learned our power through COVID-19. We now have to learn to get out of our silos, all of us, to stretch a bit and to link with those and, and the religious link. Very, very important. It's, it's absolutely true. It's a very important factor, um, especially um, in communities all over the world where we have the worst paternalism, the worst subjugation of women, and therefore the most need to recognize how we come out of this. And I, I, I just love the idea that we gather our collective strength now, uh, that we learn what the Women's Learning Partnership have been teaching us, bottom up, step by step, woman by woman, but also we have the uh, wheels, we don't need to reinvent them. Uh, luckily, especially in 2015, we got the 2030 Agenda with its 17 Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Agreement. You can see I always wear this badge of the uh, 2030 Agenda because it's the only badge I've ever liked of the UN and it goes with everything. Um, but most importantly, these are the frameworks. They've been agreed by all countries. So if we can just hold countries to account and then do the things that are necessary because of COVID, we do have to very significantly forgive the debt now of developing countries as we've done before and we absolutely have to do because they have been devastated by COVID. They're not getting the remittances because the remittances are people sending back money, but if they don't have jobs, they can't send back money. And um, they, they, the money has flown out of, the capital has flown out of developing countries. So uh, we need to recognize a human solidarity as never before. Leave no one behind was the mantra in the 2030 agenda. We absolutely have to do that now. I, I'm full of excitement about this film because I think it has captured a moment. This is the moment of people power, of we the peoples, and we have to do it. Thank you, Mary. I wanna recognize that the participants, the community with us today from all over the world are excited about the film and the potential this film gives us uh, for taking all the learning that we are, uh, has been shared here already. And I wanna take the last uh, 10 minutes or so that we have together here to go back to each of you and have you think about in concretely uh, specific ways um, address the question of how do we do this now? How do we move radical inclusiveness forward? How do we bring more people into this work and this conversation? Um, Sarah, I'll go back to, to you as a beginning. How, how does this film and how does this new movement of collective community of women leaders empower further the work that you're doing? I think first for the humanitarian community as a whole, we really need to embrace the feminist approach to humanitarian response. We've skirted around trying to work on gender. We have, you know, as a separate issue, but we need to really embrace feminism. And also I would say the localization of the humanitarian response. What I mean by this is that we really need to recognize um, women's leadership at the community level. We've done a really bad job at reaching out, and I'm talking about the humanitarian community in particular, um, at you know, meaningfully engaging women's rights groups and women in the solutions to the problems they face. Um, we make decisions without involving them too often. And if we embrace this feminist approach, I think we can reach more effectively some of the marginalized groups, adolescent girls, married adolescent girls who are stuck in their homes because their parents fear violence, or they're going to be stuck in their homes till they're married off because of economic reasons. Women and girls with disabilities that are so frequently left out, LGBTQI refugees, and ethnic minorities. When we look at the Rohingya, we have to do much more to think about inclusive humanitarian response. And I think feminism is the way forward. Um, we, 
I think, you know, just in particular, I think if we increase partnerships with local women's rights groups in disaster preparedness, mm -hmm. in crisis response, in development work, women and women's organizations, including those that run disability rights organizations, um, will have a seat at the table. Um, we need to give them a seat at the table from the refugee camp councils all the way through to high level policy negotiations. That isn't happening. We need, and I think key to this is that we must directly support their participation and leadership and provide the necessary funding to support um, their work and to make this happen. What we see in the humanitarian field is that 0.2% of funding goes to local groups. So if we want to build a collective movement, we have to start there, bringing in the women into this discussion and giving them the tools and resources. And I would also say that one of the sort of most effective um, tools that we've seen on the ground is the creation of safe spaces safe spaces for women and girls in emergency settings. And these are spaces where they can report cases of gender-based violence. They can gain vital information about sexual and reproductive health. And they can get some kind of childcare in many cases. Um, we need a space for them to talk, to organize, and really change that dynamic around them. And just going back to some of our work in Cox's Bazaar, where the number of safe spaces in a very short space of time went from five to 55, what we saw at the start of women organizing because they had that place to talk to one another, to actually talk about not only the problems they were facing, but those solutions to the problems. And I also think in the humanitarian field, we need to do far more around um, livelihoods and cash work. You know, cash has become, transfers has become the big thing. And it does give women more control and more choice. But why not use this as an opportunity to do more by combining cash transfer work with sexual literacy training? We're starting to think about people's, women's skills and capacities so that we can move them along the spectrum from being totally dependent on handouts and aid to really being able to control the environment that they live and get on that path to self-reliance. So I firmly believe that if we do all of these things and more, we can, um, it, you know, displacement can be an opportunity for transformative change. And we're just not garnering that, um, that, that support at the moment, and we're not doing it. And we need to reach out. But just specifically to end, I would say, I mean, I found that, I mean, the film is amazing. And I would recommend, and I will fight for that film to be shown to humanitarian aid workers because all too often what they fail to do is even the basic guidance and the tools that we know can prevent gender-based violence, such as locks on the trains, such as lights on paths, they're not doing. They need to see something like this in order that, so that they start to support our, our fight for justice. Um, and I think we can also show it in, in the communities. Yes. Thank you for that. And, and I, again, you have put forth the question that is so important for us, that is surfacing from everyone. Who is missing in our conversations? What is missing so that we can collectively harness the power? I'll go back to Asad, who reminded you, Asad, you reminded us so powerfully of who is often missing at these tables and in this movement. What actions can we take to bring in the faith community and in new and more compelling ways. You know, when we were fighting for democracy in Nigeria, because um, the major global multinationals were not interested in a democracy, they were interested in making money in Nigeria, so any government would serve. We had to turn to the African American churches, we turned to the US labor unions, AFL CIO. We turned to so many grassroots organizations, Amnesty International, Greenpeace, 
I think that this is the moment that we should use the social media tools that are available to begin to build, to weave together all of these movements and, and supporting each other in fighting our different fights. Because, you know, it's so difficult because so much of our time is exhausted on flights going around. But the gift of the COVID-19 slowdown has been to show us that maybe we don't have to do things the way we've been doing them. Maybe we don't have to be on all these flights. Maybe we can cede space to other people who are, if there's an event in New York and Pat, you want me to come, either I show up virtually or I can have a sister, an African sister in New York show up and open space, open yeah. space for young people. Mm -hmm. I remember that Amana, when she first started Women's Learning Partnership, she had a young Indian girl called Rama who she um, was um, mentoring and supporting to be the executive director of WLP. You know, we have to, and now I'm 46 years old, I'm no longer a youth. And as much as possible, we should give space. We should give space for other causes. We should, and when we go into rooms where there's power, we should not go in and think, oh, I have to protect my opportunity because the opportunities are limited. When we act that way is when they are limited. We have to say when we go into those opportunities that I'll be happy for you to support me. Also consider these other issues, these other causes. So I think that if we act, in the, if we act as if the world was abundant, then the world becomes abundant. And I think women are the most powerful to do this because women, when a woman has many children, like I have two children. I cannot conceive of a reality where I would love one more than the other. You try to show love in as balanced a way to the two. Women, can, women always have the heart that can expand. So we should look for these. And the last thing I think also as we um, come together is that we should also give women the right to fail. When women do it wrong, we should just shrug. Yes, that's part of learning. Men fail all the time, but women are not given this right. And it limits the kinds of things that women take up. It limits the way that women see their um, capacity and their power in a, in, a, in a certain role. But if we open up that um, permission for women to fail, then we will see women fail and fail and fail. And then finally, we'll see them succeed in the most glorious ways. One of the ways we will succeed is we are opening that space for each other. And my, my space is full of admiration for the women who have joined us today, Ben. And I wish we had more space for time, but I cannot have us end without another word from you, Asa. Um, you, you powerfully reminded us who must be in the room. Uh, in just a few seconds, or can you also uh, give us our your take on where we go from here. Um, we need to be deliberate about this radical inclusivity. We can't just speak to it as, as the others have said. We are hosting a assembly, a global assembly on women, faith and diplomacy, where we would welcome and invite all of you who have, who can see the nexus and the reason why religions and faith matters in our lives today as social service providers, as the people influence thinking, belief and behavior around the world, as men, largely men who work in so many different spaces. For those of you who are interested, please, please include the women of faith movements. There is a global, worldwide uh, Women of Faith Network that Religions for Peace has invested years in, in, in convening and bringing together. There's a global youth network that Religions for Peace, together with other multi-religious actors and secular actors, has invested in putting together. Let's work more together. Let's be more deliberate and intentional about connecting the dots. Let's accept that faith can matter and it can be a very positive, empowering tool. We don't have to recreate anything. We don't have to reinvent anything. The networks are there the power, the mobilization, and above all, the women are there and have already made remarkable um, uh, improvements and challenges within their own communities. <laughs> Let's accept, above all, our own differences because even if we don't come from the same movement and exactly the same way of thinking, there's not a single one amongst us who wants to see harm done to another. And I think that that understanding and that ability to celebrate 
one another's abilities, even where we think that they happen in areas we don't necessarily like, but that commitment to honor one another's efforts as existence is, is a very basic human commitment and it belongs to all faith traditions. Thank you. Showing up for one another, as you have done today, is our biggest lever for change. And Manaz, please join uh, to receive the praise that is so much deserved because this film reminds us of that. It reminds us we must do this together. And I know that was your intention. Final words on what you want this film to do, how you want it to be used for all of us. Well, for one thing, thank you everybody for being with us and also for Pat to do this uh, moderation so wonderfully and, and for the speakers who have brought so much wisdom. I just want to say two things uh, to end uh, our, our conversation. Uh, one is that uh, uh, of all the areas that we have spoken about, one of the ones that we haven't addressed is the area of politics. And that is something that, especially in this country, the United States, and also in many others, has, have been, has been ignored. We have not reached out as strongly and as, as uh, vociferously to participate in political leadership. And we have to understand that it, we might not like the politics, but unless we are there at the table, we cannot change much. And I also want to bring attention to the fact that simply having numbers of women in any of these areas is not by itself going to uh, help us. Uh, we need to, uh, in effect, uh, be able to, uh, to provide the kind of leadership that we want as women. We don't want hierarchical, top-down, ambition-ridden uh, uh, kinds of leadership. We want inclusive, respectful, dialogue-based leadership. Otherwise, uh, the, the world we want to change the world of, into the world we seek will not happen. So leadership of a different kind is extremely important. And we have been, we have to admit that as well, that we have been in some ways uh, participating in the kind of decision making that uh, has brought us to the place where we are. Uh, we, have, we have actually trained our children to behave different if they're masculine than if they are feminine. And we have also uh, reflected that in family relationships, top down, uh, hierarchical, reflected that into communities, into religious organizations, into almost everything. So we have to first change the nature of leadership and to bring it to what WLP which is actually an experiment in movement building, a 20-year-old experiment. What we have to offer in this way of bringing together the wisdom and experience of 60 countries is uh, the uh, curriculum for leadership, for working on violence against women, for working with refugees, for building uh, organizations in a participatory way. All of that is available in multiple languages uh, and it is, can be used in order to expand uh, our uh, reach and uh, build the movement that we seek to build. And just to mention to you that uh, so many have uh, uh, offered in, in, in this, uh, of the speakers and also through the chat that they want to show the film and use it as a platform to bring togetherness. And we at WLP are going to have the first um, uh, uh, launch in Arabic in July and then followed by Portuguese, Russian, Turkish, Persian, Spanish, and uh, so on. And uh, so this will reach an audience which is not necessarily uh, uh, a Western audience. And, and if any of you need that, we would be more than glad to, to uh, provide the possibility. So thank you so much. And let's focus on collaboration and coalition building because that's how we are going to find and reach the world we seek. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Manaz. I began by saying this film is a gift, and it is. 
It is a gift to all of us who care about creating a, a more just and equitable world. And that is up to us. Uh, thank you for being with us today.